you. Um, I'm delighted to be here today. This is an incredible event. Um, thank you to Kieran and everyone for organising it. So I'm going to do a couple of things with you. The whole theme of my talk today is about connections and reconnecting with yourself. I firmly believe that addiction is disconnection, depression is disconnection, anxiety is disconnection, not only from ourselves, but from each other and from the world around us. So today we're going to look at like simple techniques to reconnect ourselves, and I'm also going to tell you some of my story. You've all been sitting for a few talks. I'm just going to get everyone to stand up and shake around a bit just to get your energy moving. Just when you're sedentary, the one thing about energy is we're all made of energy. It's good to stretch and to move that energy around. We're all made of energy that attracts each other and, you know, affects everything we do. So it's important that, like, if you're in work or doing anything, that you get up and you move all the time. You know, we're too sedentary nowadays. So I'm going to ask you to sit down again. And this time, we're going to do just a couple of minutes meditation. Meditation is something I've been doing for about 20 years. I meditate every single day. And uh, the last four or five years, it's been one of the things that has really helped me to heal in my life and it helps to, to keep me in touch with myself and with my inner being. So I'm going to invite you just for a couple of minutes. I want to show you the power of your breath. First of all, before you close your eyes, I want to take three deep breaths. So, and out. And number two. And your last one. Now I'm going to invite you just to close your eyes and make sure that your back is straight when you're sitting up in the chair. If you have your legs crossed, I'm going to ask you to uncross them, please. I want two feet on the ground. I really want you connecting with the ground. You can place your hands in your lap, in between your lap, or on both your legs very lightly. So we're going to do a lovely body scan. So I don't want you to try and do anything special. Just notice the natural flow of your breath. This is not about forcing anything. We're not trying to stop our thoughts or change anything. So we're going to just very gently start scanning our body from the top of our head to our toes. As you start with the top of your head, I want you to start with your forehead. And I want you to relax your forehead. Relax your eyelids. Notice where there's tension in your body. Relax your cheeks. You can move your jaw if you want to make that happen. Move your jaw around. Really relax it. As we move down into our shoulders, maybe if there's stiffness, feel free to roll your shoulders back or forward. And then move down through your torso. And down into our legs. And then right down into our feet where we really, really feel connected with the earth. Now I'm going to ask you to go back to your mind again. And I want you to think of the one thing that you're most grateful for it that happened to you this week. Can be somebody you met, something that happened at work, a hug from your kids, it can be anything big or small, but something that makes you smile. And I want you to really, really bring that to mind. Then I'm gonna ask you to put your hand in your heart and I want you to bring the energy and feeling of what you're thinking about down into your heart. And I wanna get the energy of the gratitude moving through your body. And when you feel you've made that heart-mind connection, I want you to bring your hand down to just above your belly button in your solar plexus. And we're going to continue to bring the energy of that gratitude down into our solar plexus, which is the center of our energy. And now that we've made that, that connection, I want you to really feel that energy of gratitude, that good feeling place. And I'm going to count from three to one, and at one, we're going to open our eyes, take a big deep breath, and we'll be back in the room. So on three, two, and one, gently open your eyes, and take a big deep breath, and out again. So who feels even just a teeny bit better? Imagine giving yourself just no more than five minutes, even if to beginning, every single day to calm your nervous system, bring your blood pressure down, to consistently and constantly help to connect yourself and reconnect yourself with yourself and your inner being. Most people are completely disconnected. Most people who have depression, anxiety, are all up in their minds, completely disconnected. Very few people are actually in their physical body. And we do need to bring ourselves back to our physical body at different times. So today we're about reconnecting with yourself. 
And I love this saying from Bode, you yourself, as much as anybody in the entire universe, deserve your love and affection. How many people in the audience today truly believe that? Be honest. Truly believe that you, more than anyone, truly deserve your love and affection. That's not a lot of hands. And I personally would never, ever have related to that or have agreed to that up until the last few years, very sadly to say. I suppose I'll tell you a little bit of background of my story um, and my history with depression and anxiety and addiction. Uh, I started modeling when I was 15. Um, I'd always, I always thought it was normal to wake up every day and feel sad and to really get, find it difficult to get going during the day. I thought everybody was the same because that was my normal. So as the years went on, it became more and more difficult for me to get through my day. I lost an awful lot through depression. I lost relationships. I remember a boyfriend saying to me, if you just explain to me how you feel, then I can help you. But in my head, I could explain how I felt. But when I went to verbalize it, nothing came out. My voice was unable to move from my mouth. And I could never verbalize it. It was like it was stuck here. I certainly wasn't able to talk the way I am today. That's taken years and years of cognitive behavioral therapy and other therapy and the work I do in myself every day. But I never really was able to be in touch with my emotions. I had a serious issue with negative self-talk. I never ever felt I was good enough. And when you don't feel you're good enough, but when you look good enough to move into an industry, that has devastating effects on your self-esteem. Because I used to go to castings and sit in a room with 150 girls and look around me and think, my God, these girls are all so gorgeous. What the hell am I doing here? And that's all you know, surface level stuff and fun and games. But over time, that really starts to affect you. I was very lucky. I was in an industry where I traveled around the world and I met incredible people. But during those years, I hid my pain through things like addiction. I was the best part of your going. I was very good at it. I was great fun. And to cut a long story short, through the years, my addiction became worse. My depression became worse. And I ended up with severe anxiety disorder because of it as well. I used to take a Xanax just to wake up in the morning for fear that when I left the house, I wouldn't have a panic attack. I relied on external things. I consistently and constantly outsourced my power to anyone that would take it. I always looked for answers outside of myself. I never thought I had the answers because no one ever told me that I had any power. And what I now know is that we're all so much more powerful than we realize. We just don't know how to use our power. And that's where the problems start. So for years and years, I lost myself in partying. It was the only time where I got a break from my feelings. It was the only time where I felt like I could breathe for a while. So I got lost in years of addiction. And that what happened because of that is that I needed the highs to be higher, and the lows just became lower. And it was a cycle of chaos that I just couldn't get myself out of. So about six and a half years ago, I came home to Ireland for a couple of weeks after breaking up with my boyfriend and went to the doctor. And he said to me, you're pregnant. And I was like, no, I just broke up with my boyfriend, and I'm home on holidays. I can't be pregnant. No, you're definitely pregnant. No, I'm not. No, you are. No, I'm not. This continued to go on at home where I did a lot of pregnancy tests because I didn't believe the doctor. So, and I was going, oh, I think that, oh, yeah. Oh, no. I think that's a mite. Like, give me another one. Um, but all joking aside, I did think at that stage, I was 32. I was back living with my mom. I knew the situation that I had left behind in America was not a situation that was healthy for me to go back to. So I'm still at home in Ireland. And the journey that I thought was going to be very, very difficult, yes, was in the beginning. But it's a journey that has helped me to heal, helped me to find a life that is absolutely extraordinary. And I now know that it's possible to wake up every single day and put the work in and be happy. And let me tell you, that's something I never, ever thought was possible. So what do we all want? What's the one thing that we all want in this life? Can anyone tell me? To be happy. So, Ourselves, exactly, to be happy in ourselves. So we all want to live a happy, balanced, and fulfilled life. That's what everybody wants. But the thing is that there's many different ways that will get us there. 
There's not one route because we're all so different. And depression and anxiety has different faces for everybody, so there's not one way to treat it. Some people overeat when they're depressed. Some people can't touch food. Some people sleep when they're depressed. Some people can't sleep at all. It presents in so many different ways. How we treat it needs to be treated on an individual level with so many different ways. So where does the work start? It has to start with yourself. And this is something that I never realized because I constantly outsourced my power. Yes, therapists, doctors, external influences can help to guide you on your path, but there is no escaping you doing the work. And that is the one really, really important thing for anyone struggling with mental health issues is you have to put the work into yourself. It has to be consistent. It has to be daily. And when I say work, I don't see work in the term of hard. I see work now as enjoyable because when I put the work in, the rewards for me are health, happiness, a lust for life like I've never had before. When I don't put the work in, I'm greeted with depression and anxiety. And let me tell you, that still happens to me very, very quickly. I'm very lucky that about three years ago, I was under a doctor called Dr. Ed O'Flaherty and we got my bloods tested for nutrient levels. And I came back to say that I have something called pyloria, which is a genetic condition that means my red blood cells, my cryptorose produce my red blood cells produce too many cryptorose, which bind to B6 and zinc. Basically, in layman's terms, it means that in times of stress, my body is lacking in those essential nutrients, B6 and zinc. And through the years, when I was deficient of B6 and zinc. Zinc is responsible for hundreds of biochemical functions in our body. B6 has a role to play in serotonin, your energy system, your central nervous system. So for years and years and years, I didn't have the correct nutrients that I needed to feed good mental health as well. So now, yes, I take B6 and zinc in higher doses, but it is also lifestyle determined. Everything to do with mental health is lifestyle determined. If you don't change, your mental health won't change. So these are the four simple. It's a lot more complex than this, but every part of you, mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual, needs to be connected together. Not one of these work in isolation. And you need to nurture and really feed each aspect of yourself. And you need to do it daily, which is really important. You can't build a happy and fulfilled life on a shaky foundation, and that's exactly what I did for years and years and years. I put on a really, really brave face. I used to stand outside castings, and I'd be at the end of the road, and there'd be tears streaming down my face. And I'd stand outside the building and say, right, come on, just go in and put on a smile, get your book away and give them your book, put on that brave face for the few minutes that you have to, and then it'll be all over. Do you know how exhausting that is? To get up every single day and get out, and pretend to be something you're not. And you go home at night and you're completely broken. But I never knew that it was possible to feel good naturally. Because I always relied on something outside of me to keep me happy. From the age of 15, I was medicated. I'm 20 months sober. I think that's the longest I've been sober since I was 15. I think it's the clap, actually, that got me emotional. So I'm like... It's funny because even when you're on the journey of recovery, when people kind of are nice to you and when people say to me, well done, I go, okay, sorry, I'm just going to exit stage, right? But yeah, it was the final piece of my jigsaw puzzle that I knew just had to go. It was something that I wasn't in control of. And I remember I would go weeks without drinking and we'd go out on a Friday night and my girlfriends would say to me, come on, Ali, let's go home. You know, it's two in the morning. And I would come up with excuses like, yeah, but like I never get to go out or I deserve this or I work so hard. And they'd ring me the next morning and say, so what time did you get home at? And I'm like... Um, I, I think about half three, not long after you left. And they're like, really? Because we were talking to such and such who said that, you know, you left soon after we were in the club. And the truth is, I don't know, because I don't remember. And scarily enough, I don't think there was one night that I remember getting home in the year before I gave up drink. And I see some young people in the room today, and I just think... You have to get in control of yourself before things like alcohol and drugs and prescription medication and everything else that we use externally. Sorry, I don't know why I'm getting so upset. <laughs> and do you know what I always say? Whenever I have tears, I always think back to my son and I always think, oh, thank you. <laughs> this is going to be certainly the most emotional speaker of the day. Um, 
And I always think, you know, they're not tears of sadness. And I would really like to make that really, really clear. To me, when they're tears now, they're tears of immense relief. I cannot explain to you how incredibly relieved I, I feel to be free. I feel like as I've gone through my journey and every step I've taken, and I remember being sober about 13 months, and one of the girls, I have a lot of young girls and moms and everything get sober and through their mental health issues. And I remember a girl saying to me, she said, Ali, you're always saying to us that there's no shame in addiction and in mental health. But she said, your addiction is the one thing that you don't talk about. Well, we know now, no, why don't we? <laughs> Maybe I should just send her this video. Um, and I went home and I actually remember kind of saying to my mom, yeah, it kind of felt like she just punched me in the stomach. And I remember thinking, why isn't it something I talk about? And I suppose we all have fears. And my fear was, what if I talk about it and I drink again? And of course, that's going to be the greatest fear you have. You know, what if I talk about depression and anxiety and then I become sick with depression and anxiety again? And that has happened to me many times. But you know what? We, none of us know what's around the corner in life. Nobody knows what tomorrow is going to bring. And I will say that when I was pregnant, I was the healthiest I've ever been in my entire life. But I did that for my son. I did that for that little baby growing inside of me. And then when I had my baby, all my attention and focus went on to him because that's what we do. We're moms. We turn around and we mind the baby. But I completely ignored myself, like most moms do. And I didn't practice any self-care. And yes, everything was great for a while and I was going along and I went back to work after 10 days. I was a single mom and I was panicked about work. But what I didn't see creeping up in me was the really bad postnatal depression that I would end up in and the suicidal thoughts that I had and not being allowed being alone with my child. And that was the point where I went, I have, I'm done, enough. I have to figure out what is going on here. Yes, I took medication because I do believe that it's a step on the ladder, but I didn't want to just rely on medication anymore. I had spent years traveling around the world, seeing doctors and therapists and getting prescription on top of prescription and a prescription for the side effects of a prescription. And nobody ever said to me, what are you eating? Are you exercising? How do you speak to yourself? Do you like yourself? How's your self-esteem? Nothing like that was ever said to me. So I never connected them. I never in a million years thought everything was connected. So I was determined to go on this journey to figure this out for my son. But on this journey, what I realized is I need to do it for me. I need to do it for myself. Because if I do it for myself, well, then I have much more to give to others. If you fill your cup first, you have so much more love, attention, patience, everything to give to other people. But we're taught in Western society that the last person that we should be giving any attention to is us. It's the first person that you should be giving attention to above all others. And I don't care who disagrees with me because practicing self-care and putting time into myself has made me a better mother, a better sister, a better daughter, a better friend. It has made me a better person to be around. You can't keep giving to others when you don't give to yourself first. So I started to work on my foundation. I started to work on the deep foundation that was very, very shaky in my own life. And we need to stop plastering over the cracks of a very, very fractured society. We are getting very sick. Very, very sick. 40 million prescriptions in the UK were written for antidepressants last year. Somebody commits suicide once every 20 seconds in the world. That's a million people a year. We're not getting better, we're getting sicker. And we need to get to the root cause and get people to start working with themselves. We need to give people the tools and the self-esteem and the know-how. And as you hear from Keith, cognitive behavioral therapy is one of the most amazing therapies around because it helps you to understand that you are enough. For years, I carried around the story of I'm not enough. And what ended up happening was when I was pregnant, I was always told I was amazing with children. I thought, this is it. This is my chance. I love kids. Everyone leaves their kids at me. I'm going to be an amazing mother. And when those feelings started to creep in that I wasn't coping, and I thought, great, I'm not even good at this. This was the one thing that I had my hope set on. This was the one thing that I was like, I've got this. I'm going to be a good enough mother. And it was devastating for me to go, 
the one thing I thought I was going to be good at, I, I don't even have this. But what I realized was, I am good enough. But it has to start from inside of me. And when I started to value myself, I wanted to treat myself better. I wanted to exercise. I wanted to put good food in. I wanted to speak to myself better. I've post-it notes all over my house with quotes and affirmations and different things that help me in my journey. I set reminders on my phone every day, three and four times every day, check in, breathe. I start my day with intention every single day. I don't just get out of bed anymore mindlessly and hope that I'll, that I'll survive going through the day. So we've got to stop plastering over those cracks. And what causes us to feel out of sync is so complex. It's so complex and it's so different for everybody. Life is complex. Every day we get up, so many different things happen to us. So it's a multitude of things that is very, very individual to the person suffering. But how can we reconnect? And I think we need to reconnect every day. We live in a world where we have some of the loneliest people living in the biggest cities in the world. How did this happen? Our natural mindfulness moments have been replaced by phones all the time where we used to stand at a bus stop or walk from someone's house. We're all doing this. Like, we never have a natural mindfulness moment in our day. We are always disconnected. We are always distracted. Stress levels are at an all-time high, and it's killing us. Like, this is not something that's a joke anymore. This is killing us. We have got to slow down. We have got to start minding ourselves. For ourselves, for our children, for our children's children. This madness has to stop, and it is madness. You know, we've got to start understanding that we need to give ourselves the time that we deserve, because we all deserve to be happy. And it is possible for everyone, and I truly believe that. I truly believe when I wake up every morning that it's a miracle, that I'm sober, I'm medication free, and I'm happy. You know, if I'm not happy, I'm content. And contentment is the greatest gift that you could ever have. Every morning when I wake up, I say, thank you, thank you, thank you, three times. And I was saying to the guys earlier, if I don't say it, my son reminds me, mommy didn't say thank you this morning, I said it in my head. <laughs> hey, that child has been reared with a mom who meditates every day and who writes gratitude journals and before he goes to bed at night because I never, ever get any news from him. What's she do in school? Say nothing. Uh, who was in school? No one. So I was like, oh, great. What kind of school are you going to? But then at night, if I say to him, so what's the best thing that happened to you today? I get the whole day. It's amazing. So he has to actually scan through his day. And it's a good practice for everybody here too, because if you think back, what's the best thing that happened to me today? You have to go from morning till night. And we always pull out the bad things. That's easy. But to actually scan through, you start to notice, oh, I bumped into such and such. Oh, that was good. God, I would never have thought of that. And it's about rewiring and retraining your brain. And you can retrain and rewire your brain, which I find really exciting. I love neuroplasticity. I love a book from John B. Arden called Rewire the Brain, where it talks about our brain being soft and malleable. Yes, I'm a nerd. And you know, neurons that wire together, fire together. I love all this. I love that every single day when I wake up, I have the choice to rewire my brain. And these days, I choose happiness. If you had told me 10 years ago, that it was my choice to be happy. And I'm not responsible for what I would have done to you. Um, but honestly, I would never, ever have, have thought in a million years that I can choose happiness. We all have that choice every minute of every day. But you got to do the work. you got to do the work. I answer emails every day from people who say to me, it seems like you do a lot of work, Ali. But it's worth it. Look at the rewards. And it's not a lot of work. I put 15 to 20 minutes of all day, every day, into myself. I check in a couple of times a day. I make sure I'm OK. I practice breathing. I meditate. That's not a lot of work for the rewards I get. I used to work much harder at staying in nightclubs for 12 hours. And all I got after that was days of depression and the fear of God in me. And what did I do? And I lost my phone and I lost my handbag. And did I make a show of myself? And I left my dignity there as well. It's not something I usually joke about. I'm just very glad I'm not in it anymore. But these are some of the ways that we can reconnect with yourselves. And I always say, find your formula. And your formula is different to the person sitting beside you, is different to your sister, your wife, your neighbor. Your formula is your formula. You know, I often, I was doing a talk in St. Pat's for young people, and one of the girls said to me afterwards that she didn't understand that both herself and her friend had bipolar, and they were both on the same medication. And she was doing everything her friend was doing, but she wasn't getting better 
because she's not her friend, because she's a separate person. And what's going to make her better and help her to get better is totally different because we're all different. And that's what's awesome about us. And I was the person that had, was given a box of 100 keys and told to find the right one that works for me. And unfortunately, I felt like I had to go through 99 to find the one that finally fit. And that's just life sometimes. But you have to keep going. You have to keep trying. You have to try new things. When you become stagnant in life, which I was for years, I was walking around dead. I was stagnant because I was letting the world happen to me. I didn't think that I had to put any effort into life. Life doesn't happen unless you put effort in. And a lot of us, whether we get a job or we hit things that we want to reach in life, so we want to get married and have kids, we get the job of our dreams, we get the house we want, and we sit back and go, great, I've done it, I'm going to let life take care of itself. As soon as you hit the end of your comfort zone and you're okay with that, that's when the trouble starts to begin. You have to keep working at life every single day. We're here to evolve and grow till the day we die. And it's really important that we remember that, that we challenge ourselves, that we try new things, and that we keep living. We're here to live. But so many people are walking around dead. And it's the saddest thing in the world. So this is what keeps me well. It's a little bit of everything. I find I have to switch my formula up seasonally, weekly, if my schedule changes during the day. I have to keep changing what's changing in my life. And if I feel that things aren't working, I sit back and I reassess and go, okay, what's not working? How am I eating? How are my stress levels? Am I doing enough exercise? You know, and reassess that for yourself. You owe it to give that to yourself. This is something that you just can't get around. Good food is good mood. I used to think when I was younger that because I was really thin naturally that I could eat whatever I wanted. And I had no connection between the crappy food I was eating and the way I was feeling. And it is very much connected. You can't expect to put crap food in your body and be in a good mood. It just doesn't happen that way. You also can't expect to get up in the morning and not eat properly and expect your body to run at optimal level. It's like getting into a car with no fuel in it and keep turning the engine on. And the car is not moving and you don't understand why. But we do that to our bodies every day. We put bad, how many people here get up in the morning and go, oh, look at this day to me, Jesus, look at this dress, these jeans are horrible, my skin looks awful, my hair looks awful. That's now the momentum and the energy that you're setting yourself up for for the rest of the day. That's not healthy. I get up in the morning, I do my meditation, I write my gratitude journal, I set my intention for the day, and I give myself the best possible chance of having a good day. It doesn't work every day, but I'm certainly giving myself the best chance. Small changes make a big difference. This is one of the biggest lessons I have ever learned. Small changes done consistently over time make the biggest difference. It's the consistency of your habits that will change your life. Your thoughts become energy, and your energy become your vibration. It's all connected. You have got to start with your thoughts. You've got to make small changes. And if you are not happy with your life right now, well, then you've got to change something. You're not going to get happier by chance. You're not going to get happier by not working at it. You have to put the work in to see the difference. And guys, nothing changes if you don't. Thank you very much. <laughs>